Um, so, yes, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm talking about uh, one of our developments and the role that Europe might play uh, in future space exploration. Um, I was quite inspired by the talks of the session before because I was working a uh, long time in underwater robotic uh, before I switched to space robotic. Uh, having said, I'm quite a fan of human spaceflight, so not only robotics. Um, so I'm going to talk about a development um, and more about the question how Europe might, uh, what, what might be the role of Europe, of the continent of explorers, if I might say, uh, to this new era of, of, of space exploration. Uh, so Spartan Space is a young company. We uh, just had our third anniversary and we are working on habitation system for extreme environments. So not only, uh, only space, but also, uh, also underwater and maritime uh, habitats. Um, so here I'm going to concentrate mainly on, on, the, on the space part, if I might say. Um, but before starting presenting the concept and talking a little bit more about the, uh, the background behind, um, I'd like to make a little bit of a loop and say why I think our, uh, our, our era is so, so unique uh, today, what we, are, what we are living today, actually. Obviously, this is a challenging era. Uh, but also quite unique and quite exciting. And I would like to start and ask you, do you know what that is? And please don't reply, it's some rocks on, on, on a hill. I think everybody got that. Anybody has an idea? No? That's okay. Okay, um, I'll try to pronounce it correctly. That place is called Gebekli uh, Tepe. And actually it's in Turkey. And that is the first today known uh, human settlement uh, on, on planet Earth, so that's the first times, uh, the first time when um, human humans uh, changed from being uh, hunters and gatherers to to farmers and settlers. That is where they built the first cities. That is where they started culture and education and civilization. So I'm making maybe a little bit of a bold prediction here, but I, I think we are we are right now right now living a similar turning point in the uh, history of humankind um, for many reasons. But one of the reasons is that um, I think and I hope uh, that humans will settle on another extraterrestrial surface in a sustainable manner. And that is, that is the plan of the, uh, the Artemis program, which is led by, uh, by NASA. Um, and uh, I, I underline the, the, the word that you see here is sustained, uh, sustained lunar exploration. So it's not like Apollo. It's not like going there, planting a flag, going back to Earth. It's about, first of all, going more or less to the same region, South Pole. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and using infrastructure that was developed by one mission and is used by another mission, and so on. So there's a, there's a, there's a real difference to, to Apollo. Uh, we are talking about using uh, uh, local resources. Uh, this is also quite new. And of course, and that's here I'm putting my point of view as a European into, 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 the, into the thing, uh, the, the international contribution, international participation in this NASA program of Artemis. And here I'm coming directly to the point. What, what, could, what could Europe contribute or what should Europe contribute? And again, I'm, I'm showing some some, some, some old photographs, asking again, do you have an idea what that is? Austin might, I'm not sure if Austin is still here, but Austin might, might know it. This is, um, this is Miami River, uh, around 1891. Um, I took another photograph some weeks ago uh, with my boat in front of it. Um, it changed a lot. And let me explain how that change came. Actually, it's, um, it's based on a quite interesting and quite a visionary person, a woman, called Julia Tuttle, who lived around that time. And what did she do? She convinced authorities to build a train station. A train station. That's how Miami started. Miami today is an is a, is a, is a economy of itself, the city uh, of uh, around 500 billion US dollar. Uh, and that started with a train station. Now, I'm not saying we have to build a train station on the moon, uh, but we have to build up infrastructure. 
Here you have a chart of the lunar south pole. So all these missions are, uh, are targeting the lunar south pole. Uh, so there will be transport to the lunar surface, landing sites. Uh, we talk about communication, navigation, uh, beacons that have to be set up. Um, here are my trains, like, yeah, of course, little rovers, robots that might be transporting items from one side to another. Um, energy production, we have to make sure that we have energy. Habitats, I will talk about that a lot more at the, at the end of my speech, of course. Uh, and in situ resource utilization. So, and this makes a sustainable presence on a lunar surface, uh, which has to be achieved in, in the frame of, uh, of Artemis uh, in order to make a change to, to, to the Apollo mission, if I might say. And Europe, again here from a European point of view, can contribute quite significantly to that and should contribute quite significantly to it. Um, because by uh, the colleagues uh, from, uh, from the US are very, very much occupied, of course, by bringing astronauts back on the lunar surface. Uh, Euro, Europe can come in with a contribution and, uh, and delivering this, this kind of infrastructure around. Uh, maybe not all of it, but some of the elements. Uh, what I call lunar logistics, which then ultimately could lead to a lunar economy. And this would then make a real novel, novel uh, change. Um, so what I want to say is, we need to bring in something complementary. We should not try to redo, uh, redo what is already done on the American side or other international partners, but we have to find something that is, fits complementary to the, to the Artemis program. That's, that's extremely important for Europe. And of course, uh, adding something that, uh, that leads to a sustainable presence. Elsewise, we are redoing Apollo. And at least from the American side, they will have to explain maybe in 10 years to the American taxpayer what is the difference between Apollo and Artemis. Now, now I'm coming a little bit to, my, to our startup uh, that we have created uh, three years ago, a little bit more than three years ago. Uh, so I said we, we are uh, developing uh, um, advanced habitation systems. And I can tell you, um, as a European, it's quite funny to run around and uh, with a company trying to tell people that you want to build houses on the moon. Um, maybe in the US that works a little bit better, but in Europe that's quite, quite challenging. Um, but I, I will explain you a little bit the business model behind because it goes much, much beyond that. So the idea of the Eurohub project that we are working on with uh, different agencies is to develop a secondary habitat. A secondary habitat is like, um, is like a base camp uh, is, a, is a system that is brought on the lunar surface by a robotic lander. It's waiting there. There's nobody aboard. And the astronauts can use it to go further. And they will need that because here again, uh, the lunar south pole, um, there is a huge gap between the areas where it's safe to land with uh, crewed vehicles. Uh, these are the spots that are blue. And, um, and the areas we are interested in, which are areas where there are uh, specific resources, which are marked in red and in, in white, uh, in yellow, sorry. Um, and actually, um, an astronaut can go away from its landing spot 10 kilometers with an unpressurized rover. Uh, this is a pure security distance. Technically, they can go further. Uh, but NASA limits the, the distance of the astronauts going away in order to have the possibility, if something went, uh, goes wrong, they can come back. The circles that you see here on the chart are 10 kilometer radius. So you can see that actually from the landing spots, they cannot reach the areas of interest, including the lunar south pole. It's not possible. That's why NASA is calling for the development of a, of a secondary habitat. And actually, they're asking the Europeans to do that. So we were starting this, uh, this concept uh, together with a uh, European space agency, uh, CNES, the French space agency. Spartan Space is a French company. Um, and other actors like uh, the CEA, Air Liquide. Um, and the idea is to build an inflatable habitat that is conceived as a payload to a robotic lander. And that's also very important because there are lots of different concepts of lunar habitats. Uh, but unless you can tell me how you bring something on the lunar surface, given a certain mass limit, um, it's science fiction. There are many, many nice drawings with these big domes on the lunar surface. They might be coming in the future, but what we need right now is something that can be brought with our capacity to the surface. 
Our carrier vehicle, that's the, the part below uh, the, the habitat, uh, is, a, is, a, is a European vehicle uh, developed right now by European Space Agency. It's called Argonaut. It's a robotic lander uh, that can bring around 1.5 uh, tons to the lunar surface. Uh, there are other possibilities, uh, like uh, the, the NICS from the explanation company, um, that might also uh, be able to bring our habitat to the surface. But the important point, it needs to be a payload. Otherwise, uh, it's science fiction. Um, and there it waits. It just waits until, until the crew needs it. So there are different scenarios uh, what can be done. Either they use it as an outpost, a little bit like a base camp on Mount Everest. They go there and they go further from there. Or it's just a safe haven. Uh, it's just there. If there's an accident, they can use it. And obviously, uh, what you can see here on the right side, it can also be used uh, as a as a point where equipment can pass from one mission to another, or from a robot to a, to a, to a human mission. So we built um, a kind of uh, semi-functional breadboard. So it's a uh, real size, but not at all a uh, flight hardware. If you go to the moon with that, you, you will die. Uh, but it allowed us to, uh, to test already quite a lot of things. Uh, here you see it at the European Space Agency, so it's, it's, it's a photograph. Um, and right now, we are developing um, the technolo uh, technology further, uh, mainly with finances from the French Space Agency. So we are going in the subsystems uh, like, the, uh, like the energy supply. We developed the airlock, uh, the pressurized hull of the inflatable habitat, um, and the life support system where we work with the uh, European Space Agency. So we are trying to um, build the subsystems that are necessary. Um, all of the technology is available uh, either in Europe or in, ESA, uh, in the ESA member states or internationally. So it's really not uh, rocket science, if I might say. It's a feasible, feasible concept that just needs a political will uh, from the European side to say, OK, we, we, we contribute that to, to Artemis. And it can be done before 20, 20, uh, 2030. Now, as I said, um, this alone doesn't work for our business plan, uh, our business model. Uh, we need something else. Um, and that loops also a little bit to the presentations that were uh, given before. Is we have actually we have identified uh, several technology that we want to bring back to Earth uh, that can be used also in normal households and uh, to tackle some of the challenges or problems of our planet right now. Um, so one is energy management. We are developing an energy management system. Um, water recycling, uh, looping to what we just saw before, and also CO2 reduction. These are technologies that I need to make astronauts survive in one of the most extreme environments that you can imagine. Uh, but as said, uh, we want to bring them back and also uh, develop a terrestrial application for those, uh, for those uh, technologies. So here I conclude uh, yeah, with some takeaways. Um, number one is, uh, the next step, hopefully, is the moon. Often there is also a discussion, shouldn't we go directly to Mars? Uh, for me, this is nonsense. Uh, the moon is the stepping stone towards uh, the rest of the solar system. And you might have seen on the chart, it's a very small region we are talking about where these resources are. So it's the size of Paris or London, maybe. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite primordial that we have our foot on that, that, that place here. And, and Europe needs to start moving forward uh, in order to play a significant role in this. Uh, because right now, the, the European position is a little bit shy, at least on the lunar surface. So I hope we are, we are going a little bit more boldly in there. Um, so I conclude with my, my bold predictions, uh, which are, it should, are rather a hope. Uh, I hope that we are living right now a new era, uh, as I as I showed at the beginning, uh, the transition from our friends, the, the gatherers and hunters to, to settlers, I think there's something happening. And by the way, I think that the time when this happened, people didn't realize what implications that, that, that will have. And we don't realize maybe today what implications it will have to the future, settling on another, another surface. Um, by, as said, not forgetting our own planet. It's not about, about uh, uh, running away from planet Earth and, 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 and going to pollute other planets. The idea is to, 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 to bring back some technology and hopefully also save, uh, save our own planet. So I hope uh, these will be the two, two marks that will be left on our, our generation is that we were the generation who went beyond Earth and uh, saved Earth.
Thank you very much.